So thanks, first of all, for having the interview with me and for the invitation. Uh, I'm a professor of history by training and, and by profession now. My name is Stephen Siegel, and I teach in uh, Colorado at the University of Northern Colorado. I spent some time on the East Coast where I did my doctorate in the United States. So um, I began in 1999, finished my doctorate in 2005. And one of the great encounters I had when I started becoming very interested in Ukraine uh, was to study the Ukrainian language and culture and politics and everything in between at Harvard. So I spent the summer of 2000 um, at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and through many encounters with uh, people who became um, quite incredible scholars in their own right, um, Yaroslav Hritsak in, in Ukraine, Timothy Snyder, who was in my um, advanced Ukrainian class, in fact, uh, Patricia Herlihy, who was my advisor, who wrote a book on the history of Odessa. Um, I came to Ukraine not as an insider, but as an outsider with no family connection. Uh, but I was just interested in it intellectually, um, even in the years before the Orange Revolution and before politics, as we might say, changed everything. What happened to me, I, I guess, uh, with this project, Ukraine Under Western Eyes, uh, was uh, at Harvard, they knew that I was working on a, another project which turned into a book called uh, Mapping Europe's Borderlands on the Russian military and on cartography in East Central Europe. And um, because I was doing research on, so to say, census map museum from the famous Benedict Anderson chapter, it, it just turned out to be good fortune that there was a prominent Ukrainian family, the Kravtsev family, who had been involved from the start in the 1970s at the Harvard Ukrainian Institute, uh, who donated almost 900 maps to Harvard. And that was really where this project began. So uh, Bogdan Kravtsev died in 1975. Um, his wife, Neonila Kravtsev, died in 2003. And as it turned out, they had three children, and uh, the daughter, whose name is Miroslava Yavne, uh, lived in New Jersey and had this amazing treasure trove of maps in the attic, so to speak, which uh, she decided after the Orange Revolution uh, to donate to Harvard. And uh, when the maps finally came to Harvard, uh, thanks to uh, the former Yatsik librarian, Ksenia Kibushinsky, who's now at, at Toronto, you may know, um, and, and Roman Protzik, who was also there in Cambridge in Massachusetts, they began compiling the maps, and then I was commissioned to uh, write the book um, in honor of the family and, and the collection, and, and also to provide some sense of context for Ukrainian history. So uh, finally, when I was invited to Harvard in 2006-07, I had just defended my, my Ph.D., and I decided to take a little detour into Ukraine um, and this marvelous collection of maps from the Renaissance really up until uh, and until Bogdan Kravtsev died in 1975. So I, I came to the project that way, and I also wanted to make sure not to treat cartography, this is a, a theme of the book, not simply as antiquarianism, the stuff that collect collectors um, are interested in, but as a political question, and especially for Ukraine as an intellectual question in its history. I think it starts with the man himself. So Bogdan Kravtsev, um, and, and there's a marvelous uh, introduction by, by George Grabovich, um, who is a literary scholar, and, and I am not a literary scholar, but Bogdan Kravtsev was interested in maps for a long time. Um, he was a poet and a translator who was active in Ukrainian organizations through the 1920s and 1930s in Poland. Um, the family came from Lviv, Lvov, um, Lvov Leopold, and um, they experienced, I think, the great trauma of 1939 to 1949, which many displaced persons 
experienced on the European continent and especially in Ukraine. So when the family, through miracles really, and I can explain the history a little bit more, uh, managed to um, escape from Soviet Ukraine and, and from communist Poland and so forth, and, and really from the war from World War II, Bogdan Kropziv came to the United States in 1949. And one of his great passions, um, like his, his biggest passion, of course, was Ukraine writ large. But one of his passions was collecting um, as a poet, as a translator, as, as an expert on, on, on Rainer Maria Rilke. He wandered around in Philadelphia and in New York City simply buying up maps. And in an age when Ukraine as a term was largely forbidden to be used, and Ukraine, especially as a political term compared to Taiwan today, uh, was not allowed by many in international Cold War diplomatic parlance. Kropsi wanted to find any evidence of Ukrainian lands from the early modern period to the modern period and then right up to the present, where the country and region was under erasure in the Soviet Union. So, as an activist and, and as a journalist uh, in the United States who was multilingual and who um, spoke and knew five languages, he was one of these people who was remarkably equipped um, to gather up any maps of Ukraine in, in German, in Russian, in Latin, in French, in Swedish. Um, and so that's kind of how the, the kernel of the collection began. He had I might mention one other larger ambition, and that was to write a history of cartography it, it, itself. That project never came to fruition. So when I, I um, stumbled upon the collection and it was given to me, it was divided into two parts. Kropsiv himself had written a, a, a fascinating article on, on Boplan's map of Ukraine, from the 17th century, one of the most famous. He wrote this article in 1959. And he had this ambition in the late, um, to follow a lot of the historians and cartographers of, of Kiev and Lviv from the late 19th and early 20th century to write a monumental history of Ukrainian cartography. So he never got around to that. And um, in, in some sense, I don't think he quite knew how to do it, but if you look at his notes, and, and they're still at Harvard, he divided the collection into two parts. They were both chronological and thematic. Um, and he tried very hard to um, locate the regions, all of the historical regions of, of Ukraine in the maps that he collected. Where this collection ranks in the world, um, it is the largest single collection of Ukrainian maps in North America, period. And that in itself is a remarkable fact. So there have been other collections. There, there are some in Toronto. There is one in Edmonton. Um, there is a catalog which was written by another historian whose name is Bogdan Kordan there. But cartography it, itself is a very strange thing to classify because on the one hand, it's like you're assembling an art, artistic collection so the works which we consider maps are like paintings. And all paintings, um, I think, um, which are finely crafted have some value. You might assign a monetary value to it, but often it's aesthetic or um, a commercial value. Kravtsi thought of cartography largely in connection with the nation. And, and I think this is one of the um, important intellectual intersections with a lot of scholarship that came out in the 1980s and 1990s. I mentioned Benedict Anderson, so the publication of, of Imagined Communities with its chapter on Census Map Museum um, in many respects gave, gave credence uh, to the study of cartography and the renewed study of cartography as a scientific discipline. Another major contribution, uh, which was made by geographers and historical geographers and historians of cartography, was an international 
project in the history of cartography, which began in 1977. Uh, by two British specialists, one of the Renaissance and, and one more of a theorist in, in a, the geographical realm. Um, their names are David Woodward and Brian Harley. And when that project began with the University of Chicago Press in 1977, there was a surge of interest, um, not just in European maps, but uh, say the, the Mercator projection or, or Telia's but in non-European maps, non-Western maps, the Arabic contribution to cartography, al Idrisi from the 12th century, uh, indigenous cartography, First Nations or Native American cartography. Um, and, and so that project, which has been going on with the University of Chicago now for the better part of 30, if not 40 years, uh, is something I think Kravtsev would have loved. Um, he died in 1975, really before it began in 1977. So I, I often describe him as ahead of his time um, in understanding the value of maps, um, the value of maps to the nation, and the value of, of maps, I would say, uh, in geography and cartography. One more thing I would, I would add to answer your question. Cartography is a relatively new discipline. And, and I know that historical time it, itself is very subjective, but when I say cartography, the word cartography was generally not used until the 1830s, and it was first used in France. So um, when we speak of, of geography as, as a discipline, of course, it goes back to the ancient period. Um, you could read Herodotus, and, and that's a marvelous way to understand geography, but cartography is a modern science um, insofar as it was tied with statistics and state politics and the 20th century ethnic cleansing and genocide and things is a relatively recent phenomenon. Yes, so I get asked this question a lot. Um, the vast majority of the maps which he had from before 1800 were copies of copies, but there are some which are original. And um, a lot of the, the ones which he collected were quite literally um, cursed out, ripped out of um, atlases, historical atlases from um, the 17th and 18th century. He didn't do it, but someone did it. Um, as, as you might imagine, when um, people get their hands on things of, of value, so you, you rip out the page, and then it's sold at a markup, at a, at a profit. I think when when he wandered around these bookstores and antiquarian stops, the stores back in the day before Amazon, when um, antiquarian shops on the street on the corner still existed, and there were people who were really known for um, selling maps, I, I think he bought them quite cheaply. Um, he was operating on a, on a journalist's salary, on a translator's salary. He was he certainly, um, like many, like most perhaps even in the Ukrainian em immigration, did not have enough, a lot of money to throw away on things like this, but he, he made it into one of his private hobbies. And so um, I tell people, you just have to look through each map in the collection. If you're interested in what's, what's authentic, what's original, and what's not, Sometimes it's extremely difficult to determine that, but there are, in fact, many originals um, back in his collection, and um, that is something that still actually has not been done uh, to assess which, which ones of those are, are copies and which ones of those are originals. But I have a pretty uh, a good idea of the ones that are, are not original. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the collection um, first. So the, the collection is called the Bogdan and Neonila Kravtsi Antique Ukrainica Map Collection. It sounds very wordy, but it's a good way of, of first understanding um, what is in it and what the collection provides. So there are 891 total maps, so almost 900 um, maps uh, within the collection itself. Um, Kravtsi had his own system of categorization, which was 
a lot like the Rosetta Stone when I first started trying trying to figure it out. He, he had his own kind of style, if you will, of cuneiform um, with his abbreviations and, and territories, which he thought mattered between, uh, say, Austria-Hungary or the Habsburg Empire and, and Imperial Russia, czarist lands. They're divided, generally speaking, into part one and part two. So in part one of the collection, the majority of the maps and atlases, either in original or copy form, appear in Latin, French, and English. So those are the three major languages in, in part one of the collection. Um, these were engraved roughly between 1500 and 1800. Uh, they include the Bauplan maps um, from the mid-17th century. But I think one of the major points about the mapping of, of early modern Ukraine, even Ukraine from the late Renaissance, is that the map-making centers for these maps were actually quite diverse. Um, one might forget the 17th century importance of Amsterdam. There are a number of, of maps which were made in Amsterdam. Also included London, of course, Paris, Nuremberg, which was a major center for German historical cartography and map making from the late 17th century through the 18th century. Venice was another one. Um, he was also interested in, in the Atlantic connections or transatlantic connections in the age and era, era of NATO. So there were some maps which were made in Philadelphia in English, uh, a few in Stockholm in Swedish, and of course um, several, in fact many, uh, maps um, from the 18th century in, in the era of both Peter and Catherine the Great, which were made in, in St. Petersburg. So I think the major feature of part one of the collection um, is maps up to 1800. They include rare maps, even 16th century maps of, of Ukrainian land, some original, some in copy form. Um, I can mention a few. So cartographers would be Anthony Jenkinson, who was an English traveler to Muscovy, uh, Abraham Ortelius um, from his famous maps, Václav Radetsky, who was a Polish uh, cartographer and, and geographer, and of course Mercator, who's, who's famous for uh, the Mercator projection. So um, that's the first part of the collection, uh, maps up until 1800, and grouped it as such, or he arranged the maps as, as such within that. Uh, just very briefly, the second part of the collection is um, maps up until the present. So really, in this case, maps up until his death in 1975. And I think this is an even more remarkable part of the collection because it is the history of Ukraine in all of the political areas that encompassed it. Uh, it includes maps of the Ottoman Empire. It includes maps of the Zaporizhian siege. Uh, it includes maps of the Hetmanate. Um, and so there were so many European cartographers um, who were, were deeply, deeply um, interested in the world after 1800. So, for example, after the annexation of Crimea in 1783, what did this mean for the representation of territories which became the theater of war for the Crimean War in the Crimean Peninsula? So he was very interested in, in collecting and, uh, I think, establishing some sense of continuity from the early modern period into the modern period um, in, in that particular way. Because um, cartography is, is in fact an old profession, um, there, we're presented with many difficulties at, for how to study it. And Ukraine is no exception. So in an age of nationalism, modern nationalism in the 19th and 20th centuries, there, there's an almost simple assumption that nations are represented by maps and, and maps give us nations. When children go to elementary school in whatever grade, and this is true of Ukraine and, and I would say elsewhere, they are given atlases or they, they're given supplementary aids to geography and they're told to study whatever it might be, the, the provinces of Alberta and Manitoba and British Columbia and Newfoundland 
or they're made to study the Mason Dixon line and the Mississippi river. Um, and, and to have a kind of sense of the organic unity of the nation, even though, as we know, the history is, is much more complex. I think the same is true of cartography from the Renaissance and early modern period. Um, in many respects, Jenkinson would be a good example. Maps were carried and made by travelers. Um, Marshall Poe, who is a historian who, who um, was at Harvard, actually, at the time I was there in the late 90s and early 2000s, wrote a book about ethnography. And Poe considered ethnography to be actually a part of cartography and anthropology, how people, when traveling, learned, gained information about uh, the country, about the people there, about the character of the individuals, about the rulers. Um, so this is a long way of, of, of bringing up point two, which is to say that I think the scarcity of, of materials that are often there can be found, but you have to look elsewhere. And looking elsewhere means, for example, um, broadening your perspective to encompass port cities, um, points of contact, or um, traders, merchants, um, who may have used maps or devised maps for the purposes of, of transportation uh, or taxation. Um, and, and I think if you look at the Kravtsev collection, um, you see a lot of these maps made by European travelers as they passed through Ukraine. Not as they were, they were stationed there, but as they saw Ukraine um, in one of the concepts I like to use as a contact zone. So if you look at a, a city like Odessa or um, a trade route, for example, um, it expands our, our definition and, and understanding of what history, geography, uh, and cartography are. Um, the very fact that Swedes were very interested in the mapping of Ukraine um, during the Great Northern War um, from 1700 to 1721 should really tell us something, um, that they sent um, dispatched military engineers and people like Oplan uh, in order to study the region. In 1751, the Great Encyclopedia Project began of Denis Diderot and, um, and D'Alembert. And maps were essential to geography. They were essential to enlightenment projects. Um, in Russia, under Peter the Great, Vasily Tatishchev was, was a geographer. Catherine and her military officers and, and lovers and so on um, were all people who were interested in, in regions and guberni and provinces and yuzdi and districts and all of that sort of thing. But I think the strategic interest doesn't go away. It's just how we explain it evolves in, in certain directions. So my example of, of, of um, explaining this actually to try and explain it for Ukraine is to say the term geopolitics um, is a relatively recent innovation as well. It was invented, used, coined by um, a Swedish a politician, conservative politician and geographer by the name of Rudolf Schelein in 1899. And now, when we talk of maps, there's an almost automatic inclination to assume every map has to be an expression of the nation, an expression of identity, an expression of Ukraine's geopolitical position in the world between East and West and the trope that everyone hates. But there's a prehistory to this. And the prehistory is that cartographers were military officers, they were engineers, um, they were experts on roads, bridges, passageways, forms of transportation. Um, they were, in, in many respects, very practical men um, who had to have knowledge of, of geology and, and terrain uh, to know where was a good place to build a, for a fortress. Goplan was commissioned by the Polish king to do exactly that on the right bank. Um, so cartography has this geopolitical component or this media component or this nationalist component, but there are other aspects to it um, as well. And they're tied in the modern period with, with the sciences, with GIS, with engineering, and so forth. The first aspect that, that caught me as surprising was that each map told a story. 
and um, that a map was not simply a material object which you could extract or excise from from history, but it told a story of the collector. So if you could imagine the mind of the collector and, and why a specific person was interested in a specific map, sometimes to the point of stealing a specific map um, or devising something which was modeled on a specific map, I, I think that was that was the point about the, the story. So like any piece of art, one has to imagine what goes through the mind of the collector as well as what goes through the mind of the producer, the person who has made the map or the person, the publishing press, the whatever firm which has um, disseminated the map or raised its publicity. I think that represented a particular kind of challenge uh, to explore the stories beneath all of the maps which, which were in Cropsey's collection. From the level of collection to production to dissemination, the second point I, I, I would say is about violence and, and destruction. So um, one of the reasons uh, the family had for donating the map, maps to Harvard was to give them a safe place. Um, this grand treasure trove. And again, the context mattered. It was immediately after the Orange Revolution. They had their doubts and hesitations about Ukraine's future direction, what might happen to it, what might happen to this magnificent collection. And as I thought about it in writing up the project and trying to figure out um, the importance of, of understanding Ukraine as part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth or as part of the Tsarist Empire or as part of the Soviet Union or interwar Poland, I thought they really, they really had a point, the Kropsi family, because um, they had lived through this experience of, of violence and, and repression, and they knew what it meant to experience the loss of, of, of people, first of all, and, and also things that mattered. So when I went through the maps which uh, Kravtsev was interested in, especially 20th century maps, he collected maps of Soviet labor camps. Uh, he um, collected um, maps which were made and devised as part of Nazi propaganda. Um, he collected maps which were uh, made, as it were, by Ukrainian members of the SS Galician and, and Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. In fact, he included maps of Kubiovich, uh, which were drawn from the Encyclopedia of Ukraine, but he actually has even earlier works of Kubiovich, like his Atlas from the 1930s. So um, Kropsif, I think, lived, lived a life which was um, very much shaped by, um, by violence and 20th century uh, politics, um, even after he had come to, to North America. So his way of, of, of understanding Ukraine and its history or Ukraine and, and all of its territories was, I think, filtered through these through lenses, two lenses, one of, of the stories and the second of, of the violence, which he knew all too well, and which his family itself had experienced very, very deeply. Magochi, as, as anyone knows in Toronto, is an obsessive map collector. And um, he has been, I think, very skilled at drawing, even drawing maps, as he did uh, by hand initially for the historical atlas of, of East Central Europe for, for decades. Um, he has made use, as I made use, of um, 19th century atlases, and especially ones which were published uh, in German or in the Habsburg Empire in, in Austria-Hungary. His, his historical atlas, um, which was part of a great series uh, sponsored, put up by the University of Washington in the 1970s, it's a large series in East and Central European history, is a real model for the field. Um, Magochi's atlas, I think, is, is um, several, I think, several times more sophisticated um, than Russian and even Soviet atlases, which were produced. Uh, and there are many reasons for this. I think one is his focus and attention to language um, and nationalities questions. So 
he has been interested in, in the Carpathians for a long time and in Rusins and Rusin populations for, for a long time. But I think to approach cartography only through the lens of, of nationalities as reduced to language, as reduced to identities and identity politics, um, is also somewhat dangerous, uh, as, as we saw from 2013-14 in Maidan, and as we see continuing to this very moment uh, with the force of, of propaganda and, and maps as, as a means of propaganda. I think if you look carefully at all of the things which were in the early modern maps, one of the least things that you'll find, or the least common things you will find, is attention to nationalities. Uh, and I, I find that, in a way, quite refreshing. Um, I find it refreshing to uh, look at areas, regions, countries, um, by using things which are not so political, at least not political in the same way. So if you study the network of roads, or if you study hydrological patterns, uh, or if you study um, climatology and um, soil districts, um, very few maps, I think, appear nowadays in North America on soil science in Ukraine. And, and I, I often ask why. I mean, this was, after all, one of the most fertile regions in Europe. There are many other things you can do with maps other than show nation states and um, the borders uh, which exist sometimes in the mind and, and sometimes in reality by treaty. Um, Magarchi's, um, I think, Atlas um, is not inspired by, by my book, but in, in many respects my book is, is inspired uh, by his work, with the caveat that uh, I have been looking for a long time um, to find other lenses uh, to map Ukraine. And, and, and just one more thing I might, uh, I might add to this. Ukraine's founder of modern geography and cartography, a uh, man by the name of Stepan Rudnitsky, was um, schooled in German geography and cartography. He was a product of the Austro-Hungarian Empire before World War I. And he was interested in everything, everything, uh, within the disciplines and subdisciplines of, of geography. Um, and he became acquainted, in fact, learned, and Hrushevsky was the historian who, who spotted this. He, he learned about Ukraine's climates, about its geology, uh, about its water routes um, by studying German inspired maps and, and French inspired maps and English inspired maps from the 19th century. So, um, my book, I think, and, and in the spirit of Kravtsi, uh Ukrainian history, draws from that late 19th and early 20th century. Well, I, I think there are a couple of dates which I would mention. Um, the first is in 1845, with the founding and establishment of the Imperial Russian Geographical Society. And the Imperial Russian Geographical Society when it started, was the fourth oldest geographical society of its kind in the world. After, and you might, you might guess it, but after London, Paris, and Berlin. Uh, Paris was the first in 1821. Berlin was the second, its geographical society in 1828. London was the third, the Royal Geographical Society, which of course, was interested in, in Africa and Asia and the British Empire's colonial dominions and possessions. That one started in 1830. So when, under Nicholas I, of all people, uh, Tsar Nicholas I, the Imperial Russian Geographical Society was founded, it was comprised of a lot of German-speaking academics who were natural scientists, biologists, uh, travelers, um, there were some decommissioned officers, many were academics, and eventually through the mid-19th century, Ukrainians took interest as well. Um, and the next date that I, I, I would mention um, were the two decrees of, um, of 1863, 
1876 on the little Russian language, Malorusky as opposed to Ukrainsky. So many of the Ukrainian activists who became involved in the branch of the Geographical Society when it opened in Kiev um, were people who compiled statistics, who drew maps, uh, who wanted to document the existence, really, the real existence of, of the Ukrainian language, not classified as Mauritia, as a dialect, classified as, as, as culture, as a high cultural language. And that project um, met the suspicion of czarist authorities. So uh, in the 1870s, the um, branch in 1876, the branch of the Russian Geographical Society in Kiev was closed down, was shut down for political reasons, also for fear of modern Ukrainian politics and for fear um, that language would transmit modern Ukrainian politics. The last date I would mention is in 1890 with the formation of the Ukrainian Radical Party. When the Ukrainian Radical Party was um, formed, um, there were two main figures who took an interest in geography and cartography, and these men, um, familiar to anyone who studies Ukrainian intellectual history, were Ivan Franko and, um, and Mikhail Drachomanov. So when Drachomanov and, and Franko then took an interest in cartography, they wanted to ensure that any representations in maps of Ukraine were correct. And correct meant not relying on, at least not completely relying on, czarist statistics and Russian imperial statistics and classifications, taxonomy, designations of little Russian or Ukrainians as not existing. Since you asked me about the unique features of, of the Kropsiv collection and, and things an outsider might find uh, if he or she went to look at these 900 maps. I think what Kropsiv really wanted to do was to follow in the tradition of the major activists, intellectuals, political figures like Drachomanov, like Franco, uh, like those who had been involved in the Ukrainian branch of the Russian Geographical Society. Um, not simply for nationalist purposes, I, I think that's a little too simplistic, but he wanted, and I think his family shared this spirit, wanted to provide for anyone who might come along the sources to come to an independent judgment about what Ukraine was in its boundaries, in its territories, in its body, who its people were, not simply statistically represented as in an ethnographic map with dots here and population density there, but um, to actually have some resources aesthetically, culturally, politically, intellectually, economically, um, before and in case they might be destroyed. And that is a lesson, I think, uh, of both 20th and 21st century politics. Um, it was a lesson that Kropsiv, I think, lived through many times in his life, having been born in, in 1904. Um, he certainly was old enough to remember the Russian Revolution and, and certainly was old enough to remember um, the Ukrainian revolutionary predicament between 1917 and 1921. He was certainly, uh, I think, formed or at least um, formed intellectually uh, as a poet through the 1920s and 1930s, as, as Professor Grabovich writes about in the book, um, and so much valued Ukrainian culture um, that, of course, he considered all of these maps to be representations and aesthetic manifestations of, of Ukrainian culture and its tradition. And even if those maps were not made by Ukrainians, they depicted in broad brush strokes by, by um, Arab-speaking peoples, by Swedes, by Poles, by Russians, by Americans, uh, what the land represented. Um, and, and in fact, um, I do think that he had um, some deep kind of neoclassical aesthetic sensibility. He loved maps with cartouches of, of the Cossacks, 
Um, he loved those kinds of, of things which would show uh, Ukraine in, in all of its diverse and, and colorful history. One way I, I, I try to make some sense of, of this um, is to say that maps are blueprints as any architecture who is building um, whatever, a ship, uh, a domicile, um, a bridge, needs. And maps as blueprints are futuristic documents. They're not simply documents which register in that realist sense the past this eigentlich gewesen ist as it actually and essentially happened. But they are fantasies, fantasies for the future, fantasies for something that might happen. Um, Stalin, of course, had these grand um, hydroelectric dam projects and, and teams of um, mappers and architects and so forth tried to devise those. Um, what's interesting, and, and this is something that I learned from Yaroslav Kritsak and studying history with him, was um, that the maps of failures, projects that failed, are often as interesting as the maps of successes, of things that that work, functionally work, or get built. And in that sense, it, it changes our understanding of a nation at least territorially framed. Um, there is no nation, as, as we know, it's a cliche, which is permanent in its territory, but rulers thought that way, many of them. And um, especially early modern monarchs, enlightened monarchs, um, absolute monarchs. Um, in, in the age of absolute monarchy, um, really tried to draw those thick, bold lines as a sign of their permanent sovereignty, when, of course, it was anything but. Um, and there are plenty of examples. I mean, any, any revolution in a sense, is a challenge to the existing map as mapped by the status quo, as mapped by the ruler, when the ruler says, this land is mine, this land belongs to me, uh, I claim dominion or I claim imperium over it. Um, the borders are, are always quite fluid and, and, and challenged. I, I think Kubiovich is, is a good example. Uh, and I think within good reason, a very controversial example and a controversial figure, and, and rightly so. Um, the map, first of all, to talk about it a little bit, comes um, out of the Encyclopedia of Ukraine. So um, Kravtsev, along with many other activists um, in the 1960s, uh, knew Kubiovich, was friends with Kubiovich, um, and they were very interested in drawing, depicting Ukraine in its ethnographic frontiers. Now, a frontier is not a boundary. Um, there's a, a key difference, I think, terminologically. The Germans have the same word for it. If you describe borders as frontiers and frontiers as borders, they are grenzen. But this map that Kubiovich drew comes out of Rybnitsky, uh, who during World War I um, wrote, and I, I'm writing about this in my current book, um, he come. He compiled a Ukrainian uh, book about geography, Ukraina Landvolk, as it was called, um, at first in German and then translated into Ukrainian and, and a host of other languages, including English, by the way, uh, in New Jersey. But Kubiovich draws from census numbers, um, including, of course, the all-Russian census of, of 1897, which says that there are 44% great Russians, and if you throw the Ukrainians and Belarusians in there, it rises to 68%. That's significant. Um, Rudnitsky, who knew German, in fact, his family was German, and he spoke German fluently and taught German and studied geography in German, used both German and Austro-Hungarian statistics as well as Polish statistics and Russian statistics in order to draw such maps. And they appear, as I mentioned, during World War I and at the tail end of World War I in 1918-1919, um, vis-a-vis um, 
his geographies in the, in the context of the Paris Peace Conference. With the Paris Peace Conference and other things going on after World War I, well, of course, you want to make your nation reduced often by language ethnographically with a host of other factors which you could throw in there seem absolutely as large as possible. And you see this in the wonderful example of Kulijovich, even in the coloration. Um, the 19th century British empire was found fond of pink and British imperial um, territories and dominions um, appeared in pink. So you, you can see this in one of nationalist maps of the time. Um, there's a famous Hungarian map, which is in the Kropcev collection called the Carte Rouge, which was made by a Transylvanian count and future prime minister of Hungary. His name was Paul Teleki. Uh, Rudnitsky copied that one. And there's a lot of copying of copying. So Kubiovich probably copied the models of Teleki and Kubiovich and, and others in order to draw this map, which ultimately made its way into um, the English version of the Encyclopedia of Ukraine published in, in the U.S. I, I have seen and um, remember what exists. Uh, I think still to this day, some of the most remarkable collections are in Ukraine. If you go to the Stefanik Library in Lviv and you look at their cartography collections, um, they're pretty remarkable. If you go to the Ossolineum uh, in Wrocław and look at the collections, even Polish collections, and of course, you know, for those who are, are historically minded, um, the story of the Ossolineum is also very much a Polish-Ukrainian story and, and a Habsburg story since it was moved. You can find some absolutely remarkable things. In St. Petersburg, likewise, and, and Moscow, um, there are archives I can mention, like um, the state historical uh, Argivia, the Russian um, state military historical archive. There's some amazing things one can find there on Ukrainian provinces and, and the drawing of, of provinces, um, Gubierny elsewhere in, in the Russian Empire. Even in St. Petersburg, there, the maps are generally open to the public. Um, one can go there, especially for the pre-revolutionary period before 1917, and find and discover maps of Ukraine. So it's not that there's some um, monolithic political force which is hiding these things. In fact, nowadays in the digital age, um, there are active attempts by state governments and, and repositories like the Bibliothèque Nationale in France or even in the U.S., the Library of Congress, to digitize maps which were formerly held in secret, even CIA maps, um, things like that, and make them available to the public and to independent researchers. So as for Ukraine, um, there, there are historians of cartography I, I admire in Ukraine. Uh, I'll just mention a few. Um, one is Rostislav Sosa, who uh, has written SOSSA, uh, who has written in Ukrainian um, histories of, of Russian uh, histories, excuse me, of Ukrainian cartography. They're actually quite remarkably well researched. Uh, Anton Kotenko, who is uh, in St. Petersburg now, uh, who worked um, at Central European University uh, with Alexei Mueller. Kotenko also published a, a really interesting work on uh, Ukrainian 19th century and early 20th century mapping cartography. Um, uh, someone who is inspiring to me, who wrote a biography of Stuart Nitsky, a professor in Lviv, who has extensive knowledge of geography and, and today sort of trends in Ukrainian geography. His name is Oleg Shabli, um, S-H-A-B-L-I-I and has a number of, of very interesting students and graduate students who, who are working um, in the digital realm on geographic information science. So uh, these things are, are developing in Ukraine. Sometimes they're a little bit slower than would like. But as far as maps are concerned, if one wants to do history, there are plenty of places where, where it's possible uh, to go, both in, in Ukraine and in Russia, and for that matter, uh, in Poland. The first is to say that maps um, are not reality, at least not always reality. Maps are texts, and like any texts, um, text is, is um, 
inherently fragile and, and unstable. Uh, it is open to interpretation, opinion, perspective. But to say that is not to accept, let's say, a, a postmodern relativist universe. There is ultimately a mountain which is there, um, or a river which is there, or a city which is there. Um, and the names have changed. Um, the political powers of, of occupation have changed. Um, but the places are still there, and sometimes the people. Not always, but sometimes the people. So when I, when I look for good cartography about Ukraine, especially in, in the digital universe, I think there are plenty of examples um, where one can find um, an exceptionally useful and innovative um, application of maps. Um, the Center for Urban History uh, in uh, for East Central European um, Urban History, the Urban History Center in Lviv, does a lot of really interesting work with maps. For Ukrainian Jewish relations, there is a site on Facebook called Gesher Galicia, uh, which I, I think um, deserves a lot more publicity. Um, they have been um, digitizing maps of, of Ukraine and, and in particular of towns and places and villages in, in Galicia, Halicina, for a long time. So, um, you know, in the old tradition, it was not necessary for a state to even hold maps. Collections of maps were held by um, aristocrats or philanthropists or people of the Kratziv ilk. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a word or a phrase in Latin which, which perfectly describes this. It's the idea of silva rerum, um, which is a kind of treasure trove of things in the old Schlachta tradition of the, old, of the Cechpospolita, where uh, individuals had libraries and their libraries included texts and texts might include maps. So, you know, when there's someone like Yatrovich or uh, someone else who is dictating an ideological line um, to history, there is evidence that can be found elsewhere to tell a different story. Ultimately, academics, especially ones who are experts in a specialized field, are often funded and supported by government agencies which want a particular result. And I, I have to say that this is an old tradition in geography. While it should surprise, while it, it might surprise us, it shouldn't. Um, there are a lot of examples of this. So it's not just Ukraine, and, and definitely I would, I would say it's a problem in Ukraine. But it's not just Ukraine. If one tries to map the green zone between um, Israel and Palestine, or to map um, Kashmir between India and Pakistan, or um, to map Syria uh, nowadays and represent um, the zones of, of occupation or holding in Syria, you know, some say there are four, some say there are six, some say there are eight. Um, it is very, very difficult very difficult. Geographers have for a very long time, at least since Napoleon and Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, served the state. So when um, atlases, historical atlases are, are conceived, when um, school atlases are made by ministries of education with a particular nationalist agenda, one one must be very skeptical and, and very cautious because after all, um, those maps are then going to be disseminated and perhaps even digested by an entire generation without questioning um, them for, for fact or perspective or scale or color or message or any of the other things one can see. This is a book um, that I, I began working on 10 years ago, which was published in 2011 by Harvard University Press and by the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, it was reissued in 2013 with a CD-ROM. There are ultimately uh, 95 maps which appear in the book out of the 900 in the collection, which I think is fairly substantial since it's extremely expensive nowadays uh, to publish books with maps. 
maps in color. So um, this book uh, gives, I think, any reader who might be interested an idea of how Ukraine's um, political borders have changed. It gives, um, I think, a better perspective into uh, the Ukrainian diaspora um, as represented by Kropsev and, and his family, who ultimately donated the maps. Um, it shows the intersections between um, literature and the humanities um, with geography and cartography. And in the academic world, they're often did as separate. Uh, even geography is split between human geography and, and the natural sciences or earth sciences in, in many cases. So um, this type of book invites more research. And that's really my my final point. Um, it invites more research because it, it's hardly the last point anyone will ever make about Ukrainian maps and their perspective or, or bias or aesthetics or lack of aesthetics. Um, it invites more people to study, as I think the, the Kropsey family wanted, um, using evidence and, and using sources um, how history of, of Ukraine has, has changed, how it has evolved. Um, and if, if one is looking for future solutions, even in um, the sense of, of conflict management or conflict resolution, uh, anyone in international politics and relations who um, studies borders and contested borders and contested frontiers um, needs to have a knowledge historically of, of maps um, in order to... Um, in order to work something out for, for the future. So uh, for anyone, finally, who is interested in Ukraine as an intellectual question, as a site of conflict, and as a site of culture and all of its diversity, I think this is a book which is worth reading.